Hi, everyone, and welcome to Spotlight with Scientists in School. Today on the program, I have Tim Haltigan. He is a senior mission scientist with the Canadian Space Agency. He is leading Canada's efforts on exploring our solar system. One might say that he spends a lot of time shooting lasers at asteroids. Sounds like a dream come true. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, this is bit, it's going to be a great conversation. I have read so much about you. And one thing I love is that you described yourself as a space nut. And it all began as a kid way back in the days when you lived in Saskatchewan. So tell me what it was like uh, growing up in Saskatchewan, looking up at the night sky and falling in love with space. Oh, for sure. No, it was it was really incredible. I mean, I, I come from a really small town um, called Kenora. And in fact, I lived, my farm was about, you know, 15 miles outside of town. Uh, the kind of place where, you know, my closest neighbor was three miles away, and that was my grandparents. Uh, so every night, it was incredible, because, you know, you, you'd come home, or you'd go outside, and, and it was just this beautiful blanket of stars above you um, every night. And, and so, it just started as a kid. I would look up and wonder, you know, what's out there? How do people explore it? Um, what's going on? And it just, it was every night being surrounded by such wonder and mystery that, you know, naturally I got drawn to space. Of course. And you're kind of like the poster child, I would say, for follow your passion, because you were really intrigued about the night sky. Tell me about your journey from that to working right now for the Canadian Space Agency. Well, it certainly wasn't straightforward. Um, never no, is. It's, it, it never is. No, it's uh, when I graduated from high school, I, I knew that, you know, I wanted to be a scientist. But honestly, I didn't know what kind of scientists did space stuff. And, and frankly, I don't think I even knew what a scientist was. I thought it was, you know, someone that just studies biology or, or chemistry or physics. And so when, when I went into my undergraduate, I actually started in uh, biochemistry because I thought biology, chemistry, and physics were the only science subjects. And um, I did malaria research for a while, oh. uh, which was pretty neat, and then ended up switching when I did my master's degree. I switched gears entirely, um, and I ended up doing uh, sort of a combination of civil engineering and ecology, trying to understand how we can build structures on the side of rivers in order to help trout habitats in agricultural areas. So complete shift. Wow. Um, yeah. And as I was doing my master's, uh, I, I met up with some friends who had entered a competition sponsored by the European Space Agency. And it was a challenge of designing a mission of, of how you could find ice under the ground on Mars. And when I was chatting with them, I said, listen, I don't know anything about this, uh, but I love space and I'm pretty good at PowerPoint presentations. So let me help out. <laughs> so I joined the team and we ended up making it through round after round of selection, eventually went to Barcelona for, for five days. Uh, we're finalists in this competition. And even though we didn't win, um, I learned a ton over the way. And, and when we got back, the professor that was helping sort of guide our work asked if I wanted to do a PhD on the subject. So I switched gears entirely again. Um, and my PhD was, I spent an awful lot of time in the high Arctic in Canada, uh, comparing the landscapes that we see in Canada with similar ones that we've seen on Mars. <laughs> um, right. And it was through that I made some contacts with the Canadian Space Agency and eventually got hired there as a scientist. You know, that's really cool because I don't think a lot of kids realize that you can switch gears all the time, like your paths constantly change and that's okay. It's actually pretty exciting. Absolutely. There's there's really no such thing as A leads to B, leads right. to C. There's no logical path. And I think sometimes it's it's one of the things I'm seeing in young people and in all people, actually, that sometimes it, it might feel a little bit scary to switch subjects or to switch gears, but it's certainly never too late to do it. Right. Um, it's never too late to learn something new. And if you're having fun and working hard along the way, I mean, that's really the most important thing. Absolutely. Now, you also call yourself um, a geomorphologist. It's a big word. What does that mean? Really? It is. So geo just, you know, like geology, um, geosphere, sort of things that have to do with rocks um, or landscapes, the natural environment and morphology is uh, shapes. So a geomorphologist really is someone that studies the shape of landscapes or the shape of features. Um, and so both my master's and, and my PhD were the study of different shapes of things. So in, in my master's, it happened to be the shapes of rivers, um, both on the sides and on, on the beds. And um, 
and for my for my PhD and afterwards, yeah, it was it was the shape of landscapes. So why do landscapes look the way they do on Earth, and why do they look the way they do on Mars, right. and what are the processes that that form them, and are they the same on both planets, or are they different, and why? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, outer space right now, because I think the project that you're doing right now was so mind blowing when I read about it. So you are actually chasing asteroids or you're going to bring a piece of an asteroid back to earth which sounds mind-boggling and you describe an asteroid kind of like a cosmic time capsule it kind of gives us a window into our past which i loved reading that description so um before we get into asteroids uh or sorry the project that you're doing tell us first what an asteroid is sure um so the way i like to describe asteroids um is sort of like going back to the beginning of the solar system. So at the very beginning of the solar system, before there was a sun and before there were planets, there was just this big swirling disk of, of dust and, and, and gas. And little bits, little pieces of dust collided and, and some of them stuck together and, and made bigger bits. And then these bigger bits would collide with even bigger bits and form even larger bits and so on, so on, so on. Um, and basically the, the end product of that was the planets that you see in the solar system. Uh, but some of the little bits didn't get stuck onto planets. They're just the leftovers. And that's what an asteroid is. So the way I think about it is like when you're baking or when you're you know making cookies, for example, um, if you mix all your ingredients together and bake them and, and, and put them together, that's what made your planets. But there's always a little bit of leftover mess on the counter. And basically those little leftovers are, um, are asteroids. Okay, so that's what an asteroid is. They are moving, right, at a fast pace through our solar system. So I, I, I want you to tell me how it is that you are going to go grab a piece of that asteroid and bring it back to space. There must be so much preparation. This thing is constantly moving. It's moving at a high speed. How are you going to do that? Well... We've actually done it already, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so I've been working on a mission called OSIRIS-REx, which is uh, led by NASA, but has a lot of Canadian contributions. We have an instrument on board called the OSIRIS-REx Laser Altimeter and a number of Canadian scientists on the team as well. And so this mission launched in 2016, and it took two years um, to catch up to the asteroid. So it had to fly nearly 2 billion kilometers just to get there. That's mind blowing. Um, it's it's unbelievable, and so the uh, the the asteroid that we caught up with is called Bennu, and it's really an amazing body. It's about five hundred meters across, so think of sort of the size of the CN Tower, um, but it's super super dark. It only reflects about four percent of the light that hits it. So now imagine a piece of charcoal the size of the CN Tower. Uh, this piece of charcoal is rotating uh, once every four hours and it's flying through space at 101,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, and so it was just an incredible job by our spacecraft team um, to catch up with it and, and to meet the speed of the asteroid and to fly along with it. Right, right. So we got there in 2018, and we spent about two years with the different instruments on board, um, on board the spacecraft to understand where we could try to collect a sample and, and how we could do it safely. And finally, in 2020, uh, the amazing moment, the spacecraft slowly, slowly descended uh, down, extended an arm that's about 10 feet long. And at the end of it was a little sample container that sort of looks like the oil filter in your car. Okay. Uh, it slowly, very gently made contact with the surface and released a, a puff of nitrogen gas. And that puff of gas um, built up dust and small particles that were actually captured in this, in this collection device. Uh, the spacecraft then backed out to a safe location. We inspected it, realized that we had collected sample, um, and stowed it back in in a capsule that's uh, that's on its way back to Earth. So, yeah, it um, it left Earth in or it left the asteroid in 2021 and right. is on its way back, and will be delivering the capsule uh, this September, which is incredible. So that everyone is, incredible. is amazingly excited. Okay, so you've you. Um gone out there, you've got the sample. How big is the sample? Like, what are you bringing back? That's right. So uh, the largest particle that we collected is probably about two centimeters or so. Um, that's it? That's it. Well, it doesn't sound like an awful lot. That's the biggest particle. So in total, yeah. we have um, about 
roughly 400 grams is the estimate. We'll um, okay. we'll only know once we open the, the container. But even though that doesn't sound like a whole lot, I mean, you can make entire careers on individual grains of this material. And so 400 grams is actually the largest return of any material back to Earth from anywhere in the solar system since the Apollo days, since they were bringing back kilograms of rock from the moon. And so, wow. you know, these these tablespoons of material that we're bringing back basically from the beginning of the solar system are going to pave the careers for for generations of scientists. So it's just it's incredibly exciting. OK, so that was one of my questions. If kids are watching this today, there is a career they can be looking at this Bennu for years to come, right? Absolutely. We need them to. Um, <laughs> yeah. If if you look back at, at the Apollo missions, you know, the astronauts haven't gone to the moon since since the 1970s. Um, but we're still making brand new discoveries on those rocks today, 50 years yeah. later, because we have instruments that just didn't exist before. Right. And we know how to ask questions that we didn't know how to ask before. And so to me, the OSIRIS-REx mission is not only about, you know, what is the science that we can do in, you know, this fall in, in 2023 or in 2033, but what kind of science are we going to be able to do in 2053? in 2063. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there's there's students in, in high school and grade school and kindergarten and preschool and people that haven't even been born yet that are going to be making the incredible discoveries on on these materials. And so that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm so I'm so proud to be part of it. That is really exciting when you put it that way, that this is something that can be studied for years to come and that some yeah, and it's all about asking questions. It always goes back to that. It's always about being curious. Um, I want to ask you why Bennu, though? There are so many asteroids out there. Why did you pick that one? There's about half a million asteroids that we know of. So there was a big selection to choose yeah. from. But once you start actually putting the criteria on it of where you can get a sample from and bring it back to Earth, it, it narrows down a lot. Okay. Um, and so of that half million, um, there's only a certain proportion that we can reasonably send a spacecraft to. Um, of those, there's an even smaller proportion that we could send the spacecraft to and get it back to Earth in a reasonable amount of time. Of those, um, there were only certain ones that were made of the material that we were interested in. Um, so there's different types of asteroids out there that are composed of slightly different materials. And so um, the type of composition we were looking for, there was a certain proportion. Of those, there were only a certain number that were big enough. Um, if they're too small, they spin too quickly. Right. And if they're spinning too quickly, it becomes an even more difficult challenge um, to, to place the spacecraft down safely. So it's a constant narrowing down process. Um, and finally, Bennu was chosen, was handpicked from the, the few that were remaining um, because it actually is one of the asteroids that comes very close to Earth. Uh, and so what we wanted to do, one of our science objectives was to better understand its orbit to predict where it's gonna be in the future. Okay, and why, why is it called Bennu? There was um, actually a naming competition uh, that oh. was run uh, for, for students actually. Uh, and so OSIRIS-REx, uh, the entire mission has had sort of an Egyptian uh, theme to it, and and so uh, one of the one of the entries of the student competition was Bennu, and and that's what was selected. It was because um, the 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 rationale was that the spacecraft, when it opens its solar panels and extends its arm, looks sort of like the large bird that Bennu is in Egyptian mythology. Okay, that's interesting. I'm glad I asked that. It was I really wanted to know why it was called Bennu. Now, are is Canada going to get to keep any of um, these samples? That's actually one of the most exciting things about the mission. So uh, in return for the contribution of the Canadian instrument, Ola, um, and the Canadian scientists on, on the team, uh, Canada actually is going to receive 4% of the material that comes back. Uh, and, and this is incredible because this is the first time that Canada's ever been involved in a sample return mission of any sort. And so these are the first astro materials uh, that are going to reside in Canada, and we are going to make sure that they are available to Canadian and international researchers for, for decades to come. That's so exciting. Okay, so kids, there's lots of stuff for them to do out there in um, science. Um, when I told people that I was interviewing you, kids, of course, were really excited, and some of them have sent in some video questions. Great. Are you game if I share a few and um, see what they're, what they're wondering? Of course. Okay. So the first question comes from Ontario. 
um, from Zoe. Let's hear her question. Is there any other planet other than Earth that you can live on? Wow, that is a great question. Um, we don't know of any right now, that's for sure. Uh, certainly in our own solar system, I think there's a, you know, different planets can be okay for humans, but we they would need an awful lot of help. So Mars is probably the closest in our solar system where, where humans could live. But it would be really difficult there because the atmosphere is really thin, uh, so there wouldn't be enough air to breathe. Um, it wouldn't be the right gases to breathe. There's a lot of radiation, so it'd be very difficult to live there. Um, so right now we don't know of any planets where humans could live comfortably, but one of the neat things is there's a, there's a space mission called the James Webb Space Telescope, mm -hmm. and it is looking out into the universe and looking at stars and galaxies and also at planets outside of our own solar system. And so the Canadian instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope is actually helping us understand what the atmospheres of some of these other planets are. And so if we can find planets where, you know, the atmosphere is very similar to Earth's and it's about the same distance away from, from its sun, these are possible places where, where life might be able to survive. It'd be very difficult to get there because they're awfully far away, um, right. but we're certainly looking throughout the universe for, for planets all over the place. Okay, so nowhere just yet, so we got to love planet Earth, right? We're, That's we're here for a while. For sure. Okay. All right. Uh, next question comes from the East Coast of Canada. Let's hear what uh, the question is. Hello, my name is Laura Murphy. I'm in grade four at McDonald Drive Elementary. And my question is, do supernovas form black holes? Amazing. Um, black holes are one of the coolest things in the universe. Um, so do supernovas cause black holes? They can, uh, if the star is big enough to start with. Uh, so if you have a star that's that's really, really big. Um, once it starts running out of fuel, the, the stuff that it's burning to, to create all the energy, once it starts running out of that, the, the star actually wants to collapse because it's not creating um, enough pressure to, to, to keep it stable. And so as it collapses, part of the explosion is the supernova that you see, you know, blast the material out into the universe. Um, but the rest of the star collapse is what causes the black hole. Um, and so it's this collapsing of large stars that, you know, the explosion is the supernova and yet yeah, can create a black hole. Okay, it seems like kids are really interested in black holes because I got a second question. Um, this question uh, is for Maya. What's at the bottom of a black hole and where does the stuff that gets sucked in go? Well, I wish we knew. <laughs> so uh, according to the math, um, it gets everything that goes into a black hole just gets condensed down into something called a singularity. So think of something that is the smallest, 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 smallest dot you can imagine, but it still has all of the mass of everything that went into it. Um, and so according to the math, there's nothing at the bottom of the black hole except just a singularity where there's infinite density. So no volume and a lot of mass. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, our next question, uh, we're actually gonna talk about another planet on this one. Why does Venus have poisonous rain? Venus is a really, really interesting planet. So um, like Mars, it's our other closest neighbor in the solar system. And in a lot of ways, it's similar to Earth, but in a lot of ways, it's really, really different. So it's about the same size and it's a rocky planet, has a rocky surface like Earth's, but the environment on Venus is much, much different. It is incredibly, incredibly hot. Um, and the gases in the atmosphere are a little bit different than those on Earth. And so what happens on Venus is you have two materials. You have water vapor and you have something called sulfur dioxide. And when they combine, uh, they, they form something called sulfuric acid, which is oh. the poison. Um, and so this sulfuric acid can actually cause the clouds to form and droplets can fall down. Um, but they don't make it all the way to the surface. In the atmosphere, because it's so hot, even the sulfuric acid will boil uh, and turn back into a gas and go back up into the atmosphere and recondense and cause the clouds. Um, so the the acid rain there is just some of the some of the chemicals that are in the atmosphere that combine, fall, boil, come back, combine again. So you have this cycle. Hi, my name is Maya, and I'd like to ask, what's your hypothesis?
of what was before the Big Bang and why? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. <laughs> that's a really big question. So according to most of the math, or at least most of the math that I've read about, uh, there's nothing, right? The Big Bang, or just before the Big Bang, was supposed to represent the very beginning of time itself. Uh, now, there's some new studies that are suggesting that the universe may actually have had a series of, of big bangs and big crunches. So expansion and collapse, expansion and collapse. And so one of the ideas is that before the, the bang that caused the universe that we know, there was actually another universe before that that had grown and collapsed. But I guess that would beg the question, what was at the beginning of that one? And... I don't think anyone knows, but it's it's one of those great mysteries of science. And I think it's it's one of the reasons that science is so fun to study, because you get to ask big questions like this and, and try to come up with some answers. OK, we have one final question and um, you can't talk to a space expert with uh, without um, a question like this. Are aliens real? <laughs> well, it depends who you believe, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So I've never met one. Um, I've never seen one. And so I don't know. Are, are there little green men flying around saucers with laser guns? Who knows? I mean, the universe is a, is a really, really big place. Um, but one of the things we are trying to do as planetary scientists is, is really trying to understand, you know, what is the origin of life? Where did it come from? And could life have started in other places? And so one of the things we're doing in our own solar system, for example, is sending missions to Mars to understand what the climate used to be like on Mars. Mars is a terrible place right now, right? We talked about it. There's lots of radiation. There's no liquid water at the surface. The atmosphere is really, really thin. So it's not a great place to live now. But if you go back about three and a half or four billion years, Mars is a lot more like Earth. The atmosphere is thicker. Um, it was protected uh, from a lot of the radiation by its magnetic field. And there was a lot of liquid water at the surface. And so the conditions were actually right for life potentially to have formed. And so one of the missions we're working on now is Mars sample return, which is instead of bringing rocks back from an asteroid, we're actually right. trying to bring rocks back from Mars to answer those types of questions. And so in 2033 is the plan right now. Uh, we'll be getting some samples back from Mars that we might be able to look for, for signs of, of ancient life. I don't think... Like I said, it won't be a zebra walking around or something like that. But even something as simple as evidence of, of a bacterium or a single right. cell um, would be profound because it would show that life can form on other planets. So do we know of aliens now? I don't know. But I guess in a way we're, we're looking for them. Perfect. That's so great. Thanks to all the kids who took the time to send in those video questions. Um, Tim, you were previously in the running to becoming Canada's next astronaut. Why did you want to become an astronaut? Or why, why not, maybe? <laughs> why wouldn't you? <laughs> exactly. No, it was, I, well, I think, again, this sort of goes back to um, to when I was a kid, right? It was, you know, just just always being so curious as to what was out there and, and how you could go out and come close to touching it. And so, you know, I told myself at a young age, I'm either going to be an astronaut or a major league baseball shortstop. Um, now, neither of those ended up happening, um, but it was a really neat experience. Uh, back during the last astronaut selection, um, I was fortunate to make it through a number of rounds and um, unfortunately didn't get it, but I think Canada did a great job selecting Josh Kutrick and, and Jenny Seide Gibbons. They're both wonderful ambassadors for Canada. And honestly, my job is still pretty cool. So. Uh, yes, it is very, very cool. Now, would you say that you're still as curious now as an adult as you were when you were a kid? Oh, for sure. Um, you, you have to be. Um, I, I, I still get the jitters getting into work every day. And, you know, like every job, there's, there's frustrations and there's challenges and, and there's all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, I catch myself sometimes just saying the sentences out loud of what it is we're actually working on and, and how we're trying to do it. And um, it, it always brings a smile to my face and, and it always keeps me going. Isn't that great to have a smile on your face when you think about work? I think that's pretty incredible. It really is. No, it's and a lot of the times it doesn't feel like work. I mean, just getting to ask some of these questions and, and work on some of these projects um, is really, it was it was my dream as a kid and, and right. I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah.
pretty incredible. Um, Tim, I've interviewed uh, a few other um, space nuts, um, and I always ask this, and it's really right now three to nothing. I'm going to ask you too. Are you a Star Wars or Star Trek fan? Wow. Now, this was the subject <laughs> of serious debate at the dinner table in my house. Um, but It I is will, in this house, too. This is I, why I'm asking. Absolutely. Um, but I will always acknowledge my first love, which is Star Wars. Wow, you're the first one to say Star Wars. Absolutely. You no, know, I still remember um, seeing Return of the Jedi in theaters and walking out and just pretending I had my own lightsaber. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. I just can't thank you enough for stopping by and uh, sharing your passion and your job with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It was it was great to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.